Um, and I want to deeply uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been a real honor to be here. This is my first OER conference, um, and I've uh, been absolutely blown away by the incredibly uh, powerful women that have uh, populated the keynotes, um, colleagues of mine, but also people that are new to me. Um, this has been, um, I think, very much uh, a conference that lived up to its promises and stuck to its themes. Um, and thankfully, uh, the work that I have to present for you uh, today um, is really a description of uh, someone else's framework and theory, but uh, ways that I'm exploring its application for open education. Um, hopefully it's something that uh, we might all be able to find a bit useful in our work. Um, I also want to thank uh, all the support that I have uh, back home at the College of William and Mary. Um, um, also my really supportive colleagues at Lumen Learning, um, that although I've been working there for a year and a half and it's been an intense distraction from my dissertation, they are actually making a, a space for me to finish my work. Um, and then of course the, the GoGN Graduate Network, um, which you I'm sure I'm tired of, almost of hearing, uh, but the, the work that's going on amongst that group, the support that it's, uh, that it's provided has been uh, irreplaceable. Um, and of course, uh, thanks to, to Hewlett for backing up that work at uh, GoGN. So I want to start at the end. Uh, this is where, uh, this is one of those sentences from uh, a lot of writing that uh, I've done a lot of tinkering with and I'm really, really happy with. I've recently tweeted this uh, again. You might have seen this in other presentations I've done because it's, it's consistent through a lot of my, my doctoral work. Um, but this is something um, that I'm drawing from uh, the theoretical framework that I'm going to show you today. Um, but this is where um, I think you know, distills down uh, to what, what we're trying to accomplish. I think it's something that will resonate with just about anyone who's engaged in open education, um, but it really clarifies uh, the direction to go. Um, where I uh, started with this work was uh, finding and, and looking across the readings that, you know, open education, as we all know, is something that's really come about uh, from practice. It's one of uh, these movements that's, that's really originated in what was possible and what could be done. Um, and then now after, and, and it's time that it has matured, now we're starting to see some people start to bring in theory to try and understand what the hell we have been doing um, and whether or not that's been effective in getting us where we want to go, which is what I want to contribute to uh, today. So why? Why do we need to bring in theory? Um, now, for those of you who are active researchers, uh, those of us that are active academics, we know that uh, the idea here is that um, theory is supposed to provide a lens by which uh, we can uh, examine uh, empirical data, empirical uh, phenomena, um, but uh, it can also help uh, be a guidepost for us. I think it can actually uh, shape and guide uh, the progress of the movement. So it's something that can protect open education from the dilution and co-optation, things that uh, earlier today Nicole Allen was highlighting for us uh, in, in her great presentation. Um, how, how the, the movement is you know, quite vulnerable uh, um, uh, without uh, a theoretical framework uh, to this dilution and co-optation. Um, but also uh, use the metaphor of a, of a keel. Um, for anyone that has any experience with sailing, uh, you know that a keel is that bit that sticks out the bottom of the boat. Um, and not only does it help keep balance uh, uh, on that boat, but its actually primary function is to keep keep the boat from skiffing along the surface of the water, pushed around by the winds. I like this metaphor where uh, with a, a strong theoretical framework, uh, social justice uh, not too distant from a lot of the topics that have come up here today, um, we can really guide this work uh, and, and propel it forward. The real utopias, uh, it's a very clever, simple phrase. It's not mine. Uh, it is from sociologist Eric Owen Wright. I also want to deeply credit him and his influence uh, on my work. Sadly, Eric uh, died just earlier this year uh, after a, a brutal battle with leukemia. Um, but he's left us with a very, very uh, in-depth, robust, uh, clear, concise framework uh, that we can use in context, you know, all across uh, reshaping of institutions. Um, the text is actually uh, copyrighted, but he's made it publicly available on his personal website. Um, so if you do a, a web search, you can easily find uh, access to all of his materials. Um, and he's actually a pretty good writer. And the framework came from over 20 years of tinkering on his part and actual residences at various colleges and universities across the globe. He wanted to get feedback from the Global South. He wanted feedback uh, from uh, minority serving institutions, uh, and he got it, and it really shaped his work. 
So the idea here is that uh, Eric is framing for us uh, something that it's important to dream. It's important to, to have fantastical notions of what we're trying to go towards and what we're trying to achieve. Because without that kind of uh, ideas that, that might be, uh, some people might find frivolous or a waste of time, they actually can help shape and guide what is possible in the present. Because if we don't have those kind of aims, we'll never get there. But he also wants to not get stuck in that utopian thinking because that can be unachievable. It can be incredibly frustrating to not get there, but use that as a guidepost to inform our practices that can hopefully start to work us there, work within the real, work within our actual context, the things that we can actually do, something that I think would resonate with anyone that's doing the work that you all are doing. So I think that we have the will already. That's why we're here. That's why this conference, OE Global, Open Ed, this movement is moving. We have evidence. We know we have doers in this space, right? There is a will, all right? And I, I think what we need to do is keep an eye on why, why we're doing this work. We have a notion of what that is, but let's get explicit about it. Because if we're just doing without any guidance, we could end up in a bad place. We can make a mess. Uh, as the, the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So let's get a little bit of guidance here to aim towards this. What we want are plausible visions, which is a lot of what we're already doing here, but we want them to start to work us towards these radical alternatives. You know, what we heard from our keynotes uh, all along our, our, our journey here in these last two days has been really thinking about radical alternatives to our existing institutional forms, and we're thinking about how, we're, how we can redo education. And the idea is to go towards an emancipatory social change. And the, thankfully, Eric is very explicit about how he defines these kinds of <coughs> topics, we're not, uh, and how we can think about emancipation. This is how Eric defines emancipa emancipation. It's very simple, but it's actually very, very important, right? That what we're trying to do, um, what we're seeing, rather, what we can observe in the world is that many forms of human suffering, as well as deficits or barriers to human flourishing, are the result of existing social structures around us. You know, when we're talking about the casualization of labor in the university, we can see how that is directly impacting human suffering and limiting human flourishing. So, if we can transform these institutional and social structures to enable either human flourishing or diminishing human suffering, that means we're on the right track. Simple, right? Less suffering, more flourishing. Let's go for that. And then you can do it in four easy steps. Simply, uh, simply identifying you know, the moral principles that are going to guide things, and we'll, and we'll touch on what each of those are for Eric, and then conducting a pretty thorough diagnosis and critique of the existing social structures. Thankfully, we have a lot to work from on that front, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, and then we need to develop an account of a viable alternative to those. And what I want to do in the paper and what I do is bring out short cases of open educational practices, resources, assets along those lines that are proving to be viable alternatives and then trying to envision what uh, a theory of transformation to really uh, transform our institutions to get us there. One, two, three, four. Let's bang through them. So the moral principles that can guide our work um, that should be, uh, that definitely resonate with the work that's going on in social justice application here in the open education space are these dimensions of equality, democracy, sustainability. For one, equality. In a socially just society, all people would have broadly equal access to social and material conditions necessary for living a flourishing life. That's what equality looks like for Owen Wright. Democracy means participating in a meaningful way in the rules that govern our lives. And I know that we can start to envision ways that open education can impact democracy, right? We know about that it's uh, about amplifying voices, diversifying perspectives, and bringing those into the space. And then finally, sustainability, which of course has become uh, an increasingly strong buzzword in open education. People are understanding this as a crisis and that it's uh, imperative that we think about sustainability, but we don't see many definitions, clear tactile definitions of sustainability yet. Uh, and here is one that, of course, there's a bit more to it, but and essentially, it's that 
what's going on now. Hopefully in the next generation we keep that there or make it a little bit better. So this also kind of takes uh, uh, in some ways what might be a, a, the daunting pressure of transformation um, or, or sustainability and, and looking at it in a little bit longer view, which I think uh, makes it a bit more plausible. So those are the moral principles. And then when it comes to the diagnosis and critique, uh, you know, I'm going to look to existing literature, uh, excellent work that's already been actually referenced many, many times uh, uh, during my time here. Um, but certainly these critiques of, of higher education and its institutional form come from Giraud, uh, Slaughter and Rhodes and Academic Capitalism. Uh, Christopher Neufeld has done a, a great uh, a look at the neoliberalization of the university in the United States. And again, what I'm going to be focusing on in this paper is the American context, um, but hopefully it'll demonstrate the model that can be applied uh, for you for outside of that. I'm going to definitely pull into uh, critical pedagogy um, because certainly those are the principles of uh, quality and democracy that come into our teaching and learning. Um, I want to definitely talk about uh, the possibilities that are enabled by the information age um, and theories around a network society um, from these guys here and then uh, critiques of higher ed and the empirics of it uh, as the student experience and pulling on Audrey Waters uh, Tracy McMillan Cottom and Sarah Goldrick Robb, who have all looked at how the institutional form in the United States uh, has been um, systematically uh, kind of a, a poor experience, uh, for lack of better words, uh, for students. Then, moving into three, where we start to look at some of what open education has to offer as an alternative to that diagnosis and critique. So what we want to move into is looking at dimensions of desirability. You know, we want to make sure that we're moving towards something that's a little bit more ideal. It's getting us along those, those moral principles early on. It's got to be something we can do. It's got to be a viable alternative. Again, all the work that you're already doing has shown that this is quite viable. Um, all the work and all the examples that we have. Um, and then not only does it need to be that, but it also needs to be achievable. And we need to be framing how we transform those practices, those explicit practices. What I'm going to be detailing is um, I, I wanted to distinguish the difference between open things like OER and data uh, and how that's shared, you know, all these assets, but especially on practices and going beyond just pedagogy, teaching and learning. I want to make sure that we're talking about open research and how that can equalize things for us, as well as how we can start to bring open principles into the organization and governance of our institutions. If we're talking about radical change, uh, it's going to need to include all those dimensions. Ultimately, what we're trying to do when we're framing open education as an alternative um, is to, to move what is predominantly the case right now, where the vast majority of power uh, affecting educational institutions really is the economic power. And they're a capitalist system. This is the bottom line. This is what's uh, influencing most things. But with open education, the idea is to move the power over to uh, the people and the participants in the institutions and away from the economic power. Um, we'll always have economic power under capitalism, and I'm not proposing that uh, we're going to be able to move society to a socialist one, um, although all my Marxist uh, professors have promised me the revolution is coming. I haven't seen it yet, and I think, uh, and I think Eric is, takes a very pragmatic view towards that, which I find actually really exhilarating. And to get us there, he actually frames transformation in three ways. So there is that revolutionary ruptural change um, that many people call for. Um, but uh, uh, I'm wary of, and I think Eric Owen Wright is also wary of, uh, because it's often violent, um, and it can be a uh, harmful um, and painful process. And um, it's one that, um, if it happens, it happens. Um, but it certainly has a, a lot of unintended consequences. Um, rather than that, um, think about the ways that you have already been practicing, and those really line up, I think, with the interstitial transformation, where you can make changes in your existing institutions in the margins, right? We've seen some write-ups on this. We already know that this is what's happening. But also symbiotic, right? When we've seen all the policy analysis brought forth here, we know that some of, some of what's going on in open education really resonates with academic leadership, with policymakers at the state level. They like the cost savings. 
So we can leverage that alignment with these broader goals to move in these practices that will ultimately get us towards a more socially powered educational institution. So through those four steps is where we should be able to arrive, you know, finally back here at this summation where open education does have the potential, I think, uh, to sustainably transform uh, our educational institutions in these ways. Um, I look forward to getting this out and published so you can start to apply it in your own context. So I'll now turn over to, uh, to questions. And I have tweeted out the, the slide deck, which includes uh, the actual uh, references as well, so you're welcome to, to, to dig through those. Well done, Jamison. That's a powerful closure of the conference. Questions and input to Jamison? Questions? Um, I've had the opportunity of listening to this a couple of times and really thinking it through. So um, what I was thinking about is that although I think the interstitial niches and, and crevices dimension for change is, is so critical and I think so achievable for many people, I actually am beginning to think that some component of revolution may not be, in fact, in today's world, um, this sort of digital um, mass um, change.org stuff that then develops major kinds of, um, uh, you know, school students leaving their school and, and marching and actually doing active um, democracy. To me, that's a kind of the edge of the revolution and I think it's valuable and I think it's timely and I th I'm anticipating we will see more of that because things in wealth and, in, and income inequality have become so horrible. It's become uh, untenable for many. So when I see young people taking to the streets in that revolutionary fashion, no one wants to bash each other over the head, but it, it, it has that edge. Um, I would like to propose that there's... In times of desperate measures, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that, particularly from young people. And I think that we could be a little more um, provocative and suggest that, hell, do more. And if, that is quite, if that's the edge of revolution, I, I think there's some power and timeliness in it too. What, do you think that it's always dangerous to kind of go there? That's what I wanted to know. Is there a place no, for No, no, I, I think, uh, yeah, you make a, a, a really great point uh, worth exploring because, um, you know, when, when people do talk about social change, uh, they also do mention how imperative it is to have, you know, boots on the ground and people in the, in the streets as well as policy. Uh, uh, we need to have lawyers that can do that part. We need to have policymakers that can do that part. We need boots on the ground as well. So maybe it is a synthesis of, of all of them. Uh, Thanks, Jameson. Uh, Bill Johnson from Scotland. That's a very stimulating talk you've given us right at the end of the day, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, one thing that struck me that would be interesting to hear a wee bit more about, perhaps if you can, would be time. But I think the, 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 the situation we're in just now of, of the neoliberalisation of higher education, healthcare, and many other things uh, didn't all happen overnight and it didn't take centuries either. It was steadily worked up through the 20th century. Uh, do we have to wait for the same length of time uh, to achieve the real utopia, do you think, uh, as the, the real utopia of the neoliberals uh, is, uh, is where we are just now? So it's, it's impossible to tell uh, exactly how long uh, the actual implementation uh, of this kind of change uh, will take. But the point to uh, Eric's framework is that we really do want to inform practices that we can do like today, like in, in very short order, things that can be implemented now that start to move us towards that utopian uh, framework so or that utopian vision. So if we can start to, to look uh, towards that as our, as our guiding light, there's things that we are already doing, things that have been done that uh, I think are actually moving us, you know, away from that, uh, that you know, uh, actually working us, you know, to, to borrow uh, Su Ming's uh, words, uh, that are, we, we're repairing, right? We're repairing this, this uh, what is evidently a very broken system. Um, it's, it's underway. Um, so that's a hopeful thing, I think. Last one. Well done, you made it. Well done, you made it,
That was powerful. A round of applause to yourself as well for having stayed up to the last minute. Round of applause for yourself.